I'm in with Ramna.js, and uh, I'm going to cover some basic functional programming theories as well. And so, uh, uh, just some fun facts. Uh, I'm John, and I'm a front-end engineer in, in Loas. We are a digital wealth solution platform, and you probably heard many others, but so we are another, uh, and uh, we are doing some wealth management stuff, enable you to access world-class shared uh, fund house with a fractional cost. And uh, our front end stack is highly relying on functional programming. And uh, we don't have low dash dependency. We don't have uh, a lot of imperative stuff, especially in our selectors and uh, also the reducers. You know, because of the nature of React and Redux, uh, the unidirectional way of flowing your data and the way that Redux handles the, the events using the event sourcing pattern. So we think functional programming fitted very well with the reducer and the selectors. So I'm going to cover those and give you some code snippets as examples. Uh, sorry, my clicker is not working. OK, great. So what is functional programming? So it's just a fun programming paradigm. So mapped from a lot of mathematical functions. So a lot of people making the jokes that how to learn functional programming, they will say, oh, just get a PhD of computer science or PhD of mathematics, then you'll know functional programming, which is not necessarily true. And uh, so today I'm going to try to sell some, some of my two cents about why functional programming could be something you should look into that. And uh, so functional programming is more about uh, being declarative, expressive. You don't care about how to achieve something. You care more about how are you going to transform the data and uh, what are you going to do with this stuff. Uh, so you know, if you have written Java, like some other object-oriented uh, uh, stuff, like those procedural programming, it's more focused on I get uh, specs from the product manager and uh, look into my code base. How can I tweak my code to achieve this goal? But with the functional programming, you care more about the being declarative. You care about the reuse of your functions. And the function is a first-class citizen in this paradigm. So this is just a snippet of one of the earlier joiner of our team. And one day, he just opened the code base for the first time. And he read the code. He's like, wow, this is really cool. Everything seems very elegant. So if in the traditional way of handling track catch, you'll probably spend a lot of lines just to dread a track block. But after that, you can actually, uh, you have to have a catch block. Then you have a final block or something else to get the error code from the object. So with the functional programming stuff, you can just basically do it with this way. So you try catch, you try to parse the JSON, uh, some string to JSON object. If it doesn't work, you give a default value, which is an empty object. And after that, you pass that value to this function. It takes out the error code from that object. So it works just like that. And uh, it's like a writing an article. Uh, it's very uh, expressive. Yeah. So the first thing I want to share about a functional program is uh, purity. So pure is very important when you're writing a function in the functional programming paradigm. Uh, what is pure? So it basically means when you give the same input, it always generates the same output without producing any side effects. Uh, so it's just like a math function. So I'll give you some really simple example. You have a function that is add. It takes in two parameters, A and B. And uh, you just sum them together and return that. So if you evaluate them for two times with the same arguments, you're going to get the same output. So this is pure, because it doesn't modify anything that is shared. It always gives you the same output. The huge benefits of that is that you can easily do memorize. You can easily do uh, testing on top of that, because it's pure. So the next example, I'm going to show you what is impure. So this function declared with the let syntax is a mutable. And uh, we assign a primitive number 1 to it. And in your increment function, you actually take out a parameter n. And uh, you just uh, sum a and n return that. But uh, meanwhile, you do the plus equals, so your a is mutated. You are modifying a shared state out of your function scope. So if you evaluate increment function with the same parameter for two times, you generate a different output, 2 and 3. So this is impure. We should try to avoid that uh, in your, when you are writing some functional stuff. But uh, it's very difficult in practice, actually. So another two examples using the 
built-in array functions. So slash is actually a pure function uh, because this code actually takes all the first elements from the array one, two, three, and uh, it returns you a new element that is inside an array. So it doesn't modify the original array. But if you look at the impure function, which is splice, we seldomly use that, but uh, actually it's one of our interview questions. So uh, splice basically takes out the first element and uh, it returns you the first element, but meanwhile it modifies the original array. So your original array becomes two and three instead of one, two, three. So it's modifying something outside of the function's control. So that's why it's impure. And another good example is math.random. You don't pass any parameters, but if you call, call it two times, it gives you two different output. So it's unpredictable. So that's why it's impure. And uh, maybe it sounds something from Earth, uh, Mars, I don't know, but uh, actually if you are writing React, Redux, you are actually doing with a lot of, uh, you are dealing with a lot of pure stuff every day, especially in your reducer. Uh, you know, when you, when you try to mutate a Redux store, you're not gonna mutate the original Redux store. What you're gonna do is you copy that entire thing and uh, you plug the new thing and return it as a new stuff. So this is a popular example from Redux official documents. So when you add a to-do in your reducer, instead of, modif uh, instead of calling state.push to add a new to-do object into the array, you actually using the spread operator, copy the entire state into a new array, and you put the new to-do at the last position of this array. So basically, you are doing something pure. Uh, because the nature of Redux is more like an event solving pattern, you don't care about uh, what's the current value of that. You care more about what are the events that is modifying my store. So because of the functional purity stuff, it's more easily for you to predict the next value, next snapshot of your store. That's why um, Redux just doing like this. And uh, the next thing is side effects. So what are the side effects? So just now we talked about like, uh, if you modify something that is shared out of your functions control, that is definitely a side effect. So some other side effects in our real programming life, like you read a file from the system and you write that, that is a side effect. Or you call a remote API to modify something, that is a side effect. And also, if you are, your function is calling a function that has side effects, then your function is also, uh, also having, your function also has side effects. So I'm not saying that having side effects is something wrong, it's just something you should try to avoid that when you write your pure function or functional stuff. There are many certain, there are many different ways to manage your side effects in your functional stuff. Like you can use uh, Monad in Haskell, you can use uh, like Saga in Redux, you can use Reactive GS, which is observable to manage all the side effects. So what I'm saying is that uh, using side effects is nothing wrong, it's not forbidden. It's just that you have to be careful when you are writing functional programming about that. And uh, so just now we talk about the purity. Uh, same input, same output, and no side effects. So this one is another important thing. It's called a currying. So currying basically means you transform a series of arguments into a chain of functions that each function takes one single argument. So you keep accumul accumulating all the arguments until you get enough arguments to generate the output. Then you return the evaluation of that. So don't worry, it sounds really alien sometimes, but I'm using some example. So add is actually a function, the same add function as we talked about just now. So instead of taking two arguments and sum them together, we actually write a function that takes one argument A and it returns a function that takes in another argument B. And after we get both A and B, we return A plus B. So uh, the, the, good, the good, I mean, the benefit of using that is you can do partial application. It's going to make your function more reusable. So for example, you have a very generic add function. It can add any numbers. But you, if, what if you want to do a add one, which is increment? So you just declare partially. Um, you just partially apply that to the add function. You do add bracket one. And the next time when you call increment, it always add one into the second argument. So it's the equivalent version of calling this add bracket one, bracket two. That's currying. So you may be wondering why I should bother about currying when I write a function. 
So because currying enables you to write a lot of point free style code, so in Wikipedia it's called a tacit, tacit, tacit program, I think. Yeah. So I'm gonna show you some code snippet that is uh, doing point free. So this is a water function. It takes in a parameter, and uh, count is a function from Ramda. You can think it as a switch condition stuff, and uh, so the it actually takes in a parameter and pass it to the first predictor, which is equals zero. So you basically testify that whether this parameter passed into water function equals zero. If it's true state, then you return water freeze at a zero central degree. Then, if it's not zero, you actually pass to the pass the parameter to the pass the argument to the second one, which check if it's equals to 100. If it's equals to 100, you return water boils at a 100 central degree. And the last one is the placeholder from Ramda, the cap T. It means regardless of what you are passing to me, I always return true. So this is like a default uh, statement in a switch block. So this means, oh, oh if it's not, zero, it's not zero or 100, I just using the string template to print that value. And the same for the second one, it's illegible to vote. You're taking a parameter h, and you pass it to it's over 18, and pass it to a citizen. If both of them satisfy, satisfy your predictor, you return true. So if you don't use curry, you are gonna write it in this verbal way. So you basically just uh, stupidly passing the same value to the second uh, position of the argument. Yeah, just like that. So you are repeating yourself many times, but it doesn't help much. So that's why this is called a point freestyle, where curry can help. So when your code base grows larger and larger, you find out if you use point freestyle, uh, your code base is going to be cleaner and more readable. Of course, the downside is that if a person doesn't have enough functional programming experiences, he could find he could get lost because he will look at this code, see, oh, this looks like a good article. It's really expressive. It's very clean. However, where are we passing the arguments? I don't know. I didn't see anything. I didn't see arrow function. So yeah. So basically, that's occurring. Yeah. So. Yeah, maybe you are still feeling lost if you don't have experience in curry, but just spend one or two hours reading some Ramna documents or YouTube videos talking about curry, you'll find that it's nothing. It's just some um, mathematical stuff to make your code look um, better. Okay, so this is an example from our production code. So before we apply functional stuff, you can see we use switch block. Basically, it takes in a risk tolerance and it returns some properties for our front end. And uh, yeah, this is quite long. I didn't count how, I mean, how many lines are that. But if you look at the functional way of rewriting that, so we just call it a derived slider properties from risk tolerance. And we, we are even using memorize for, it, for that. Why? Because we are writing pure function. We are confident that giving the same argument this, uh, the, they will, it will generate the same output. So you can use, uh, you can sacrifice some memory space to increase your evaluation speed. One common interview question being asked in those companies are like, write a program to generate Fibonacci numbers. So if you are use this pure function stuff to evaluate that, uh, you can just uh, wrap it with uh, memorize stuff. So it can reduce the uh, uh, time complexity because you memorize the arguments if you hit the same arguments, you don't bother to evaluate the logic. You just return whatever is stored in the memory. OK, so the next, the last uh, uh, concept about functional programming I want to talk about is function composition. This is a key thing in function, um, pro function programming. So function composition basically means you are applying a series of functions. And uh, the second function, uh, the later function, always takes the return from the previous function. So basically, you are chaining an evaluation of that. And uh, if you write it in a imperative way, which is at the left-hand side, if you are a Java developer or Python, you probably see this many times. You actually pass the x to a method f, and you get the result. You pass it to method g, and you pass the result to method h. So you nest a lot of brackets. And uh, with a functional way, you basically just say compose. Because compose in math is from right to left. So you read that function from right to left. It means, oh, I evaluate x with f. 
I get the re return and I pass it to function g. And I get the return, I pass it to function h. As you can see, it's easier to read than the first thing. The second thing, you focus more on implementing your data transformation functions instead of how you achieve your goal in an imperative way. That's the key difference between functional programming and uh, procedural or say uh, imperative programming. So I'm gonna give you an example of conversation. So you get a function f, actually it's a brush something to blue. And you get another function g return wealth miss. And you, get, you apply that function, you actually get Aladdin. Um, maybe you haven't watched that movie, but I haven't watched it as well. I just got this picture from Reddit. So yeah. so yeah, so this is actually a function conversation. And if you write it in program, it's just simple like this. So you have a compose from right to left, and to Aladdin function is compose f and g. So you, to Alad, you, you just call to Aladdin, you pass a person to that, then you become Aladdin, that's it. So you care more about how to transform that. And uh, yeah, some people may be picky, picky here. Oh, you are doing it uh, anti-human because why I have to read it from right to left? It's fine, you can use PEP from left to right. But if you want to look looks like more elegant, you just do compose, you know, just, just to pretend you are really good at functional programming, <laughs> just use compose, yeah. Okay, so some more examples in our production code. Uh, this is from our selectors, so if you are familiar with selectors, basically it takes in a state and it uh, generates some values you can use in your components. And uh, yeah, so yeah. I have nothing to explain here, but it's just expressive. The code tell what it does by itself. So one benefit is that, for example, for this snippet, maybe a little bit too small. I actually don't know how to zoom, sorry. So uh, yeah, so basically you have get, I, uh, get its portfolio self-selected, you have get portfolio ID. So if you look at the compose, both of them share the function called get investment plan. So that's the beauty of functional programming. You tend to make your code more reusable. And when you compose that, it works like a magic. It works like you plug all the pipeline together, you just uh, bring in the water, it somehow just flows to the end of your pipe. You don't care what's going on in the middle. So yeah, so that's all about functional programming. The last awkward thing I wanna talk about is uh, functor. Uh, you may feel why I'd bother with the functor because it sounds like another area to me. But the functor basically means, uh, you, so, so the simple definition of functor is that something you actually have a, an object has a map method. That's a simple way, it's not always correct. So the better answer is a functor actually is an object a base of functor laws. So the two laws are uh, identity law and associativity law. So I'm gonna give you two really simple code examples to demonstrate what they are. This sounds fancy, but they are really simple. They are, they are created by some mathematical PhD to you know, try to scare our, like, like me, like average person. But actually it's not difficult. So yeah, so identity law, it means that you have an array of elements and you have a map method. So you just return itself in your map function. If it generates the same thing as your original array, for example, it means this obeys identity law. Basically it means your map doesn't do anything magically. So this is identity law. Just apply the map function to return itself. The second law is associativity. So associativity means, for example, here we have a function f. It takes in x and a plus two. And the function g takes x and a plus, oh sorry, function f multiplied by two. And the function g plus two. So you just do this, you have the something you want to evaluate if it's functor, you just call the map function of that and apply g, and you, then you call dot map f. So basically in this case, you basically plus two here, which get four, and you map it by multiply two, so you get eight, which is this one. And if you look at the right side, instead of chaining the map of itself, you just do it in one map by composing all the functions. So if you get the same output, which is the same output here, basically, so you get, you compose g first, so g means plus two, you get four, then you compose f, so you get four multiplied by two is eight, so you, I mean your 
the left and the right of your strict equal sign are actually the same. So this is an associativity law. So array in JavaScript is definitely a functor. Some people say promise is also a functor because a do you can chain dozen. But strictly speaking, it's not uh, really a functor. You can search on Google. There are explanations about that. And the last, I'm going to show you something really fancy. This is something I have never seen before until I worked on an open source project about blockchain. It's uh, one of the biggest blockchain wallets in the world. So their code base is entirely in JavaScript, but they are doing a lot of Haskell stuff in the JavaScript. That's amazing. So this is something I learned from their code base. They use a, seri uh, they use a class type called a tagged union. I'm not from mathematical background or computer science, so uh, I have never really you know, learned this concept before. But after doing, uh, learning their code base, I found it's really amazing. So basically, tagged union, someone call it a disjoint union or some types. So it basically means you have something, you, ha you can declare different types in an object. So it's not like Java. Java, if you define class, that class itself is a type. So in this way, in, in tagged union, you can have an object. That object can contain different categories, different types. When you use that object, you can only use one type of it. So I'm going to talk about why this is really amazing. So in your UI design, for example, if you are calling an API, you tend to design four states. If your designer is good. So you have an initial state. You have a loading state, you have a su success state, you have an arrow state, right? So this is the actual design of our product. So we have in our reset password flow, after user clicks the reset, email, uh, reset password link in the email, the React app is actually at the initial state. So the component did mount will trigger the action to verify the one-time URL because you, you want to make sure it's safe, it, it's not expired, right? So you call an API. Basically, when you are calling the API, it's loading. And if the API say, oh, this URL, this reset password token is not expired, it's still valid, you show this success page to enable users to set, your pa to set his new password. Otherwise, you show a failure, you show an error message, say, oh, your token may have expired or something. So this entire process is an asynchronous API call. And uh, to use tagged union or sometimes to solve this problem, we are using a library called Daggy. So there is a function called tagged sum. You can declare something just with these four types inside the object, not ask loading, failure, success. That's it. So how does it work with the React Redux? So in your reducer, you have a not ask the function mapped to an action. And when it's invoked, it actually set mutates the value of this remote object to not ask. So for example, when, the co when, when your component is rendering, you just set it to not ask because you are not calling API. You haven't called API. And then if it's loading, you just set remote.loading. If it's success, you just call it remote.success, pass the payload to it. And if it's failure, you pass remote.failure with that. That's it in the reducer. And we are using Saga to manage our set effects. So I'm showing a code snippet of Saga. So, uh, so this one, we get a reset, reset password token from action payload, and we call the loading function, loading action. So you, the loading action will flow to reducer, and it will, it will call this one, the loading. So it will set to remote.loading. And if the API returns success 200, you basically put a success action and bypass the response into this action. So it flows to this method, in your, uh, this block in your reducer. You basically set the, remember we talked about that, this is an object that can have different types. So success is one of the types. You're basically setting the type of that value. And uh, if it, there's something that you know, unexpected happened, you just set a failure. So it comes to this code block in your reducer. You set it to failure. So then you're going to come back to this UI design. So after you get all this, how are you going to use that to render the code? So it's just as simple as this. You, get, you use a selector to get the remote object, and you call this category function. So category, fu category theory is another big stuff in functional programming. I'm not an expert, so I will not talk about it. But basically, you call this category function. You say, oh, if this remote object, this type class, if it's success category, I render password form. If it's not asked, I show a loader. If it's loading, I also show a loader. 
If it failed, I show an error message. So this four status actually mapped to this React design, this design for the React. It works just seamlessly like that. So all our API calls are actually relying on this remote object. And uh, you can even chain that. You can chain that to make it uh, like a, look like a monad. So you can chain that like your render function say, oh, if verifying reset password is success, you actually render set password form. In your re render password form, you can make it as a category. So if you, pa if you haven't, after you successfully verified your password, reset password token, you render this. And before users start setting the new password, you actually render this one. This is a form. This is the reset password form you, you, you were seeing just now. And uh, if user clicks set my new password, it will just show a loader. If it failed, it will show an arrow component. If success, it will show a success component. So you can change this stuff. You know, your designer may like this you know, workflow design all the time, but for developers, if you don't use this cat, uh, kind of you know, um, category type to implement that, you'll probably end up with a lot of switch case, if else check, if this status is that, I render this. But with this uh, remote object that we are doing here today, you can easily do this category or conditional rendering easily because all your design basically just uh, follow these four states. That's work very well with uh, Tech Union. And uh, if you search on Wikipedia, there's another type called uh, product types. Uh, that is something else, but if you are interested, you can just do it by yourself. And uh, so one of the last thing is, um, so if, so uh, I didn't really touch a lot of Ramda, but in the code snippet, actually all the functions are from Ramda, most of them. So I actually like to use the productivity tool when I implement Ramda. So I'm an off red guy. Uh, sorry, this is not clear. So I'm an off red guy, and this is just an off red. So if you want to search for a Ramda function that you know the function name, but you don't know the exact uh, arguments, you just say Ramda, what is when function? So it tells you, oh, it's the test of final argument by passing into given predict function, blah, blah. If you hit enter, it will just open the documents of that easily. It's really my work body in everyday coding life. And uh, I mean, if you want to do something fancy, you can even say, um, oh, I don't know the exact name of this function, but I want something takes in an array, and it gives me another array. Uh, am I doing any typo here? Yeah, so you can say, I want an array. It gives me another array. So it actually show you all the functions can achieve the function signature you are asking for. This is really cool. And I love Alfred, I'm a paid user. So I think that's all. And uh, yeah, with that, I end up my meetup se session. Yeah, thank you. So uh, any questions? I'm not an FP expert, but I will try my best. <laughs> yeah, please. Right, right. So actually, that's a really good example. Uh, sorry, good, 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 good comment. Good question. So uh, we did face some challenge, but uh, we we were having three front end developers, and uh, we are getting one more, and uh, one guy left. So all of them so far actually are enjoying a lot of learning functional programming. I think because of nature of functional programming is more, it's, it's actually enforcing you to think more when you are writing program. So uh, people really enjoy that. But to business people, they are like, oh, why you are, um, if they don't know what is functional problem, they may be like, oh, why you are rewriting your code into functional stuff? What is the business value of doing that? So that part, I would say, is more challenging than asking your developers to do functional programming, because usually your developers will be like, uh, oh, this is something new, really cool, I will learn that by myself. But for business guys, they are like, uh, don't bother, do that. Just uh, deliver what you want. Our customer will be happy. Yeah. So, so that's uh, actually a challenging part. But if you really want to know how to handle that, I think uh, 
hiring the right people is very important. If you hire someone that is really lazy, he doesn't want to do anything new, you're probably, it's never going to happen if you ask him to learn what is curry, what is composition. That's impossible. I think uh, that's probably be my answer. But the learning functional stuff is really interesting. I enjoy myself of doing that a lot. And I have seen our team members are enjoying doing it a lot. So they really change a lot of code into a functional way by themselves. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. OK, any other questions? OK, I think, uh, yeah, thank you.